So I'm the Chief Compliance Officer at Paxville, and why don't we do a quick introduction to the rest of the panelists. Can you start with that? Sure, so good afternoon everyone. I'm Tom Robinson, one of the co-founders of Elliptic. At Elliptic, we help crypto companies and financial institutions with their crypto risk management. So for example, we have a uh, crypto transaction screening tool based on blockchain monitoring that helps exchanges to prevent their platforms from being exploited by criminals. We also spend a lot of time talking to regulators around the world, um, educating them about cryptocurrency technology, and also trying to persuade them from putting in place overly onerous regulation. Hi everyone, I'm Haley Lennon. I'm head of legal and regulatory affairs at Bitflyer. We're an international cryptocurrency exchange company. We've been operational in Tokyo, Japan since 2014, and I helped lead the US expansion on the legal and regulatory side um, back in 2017. So obviously there's a lot of global regulatory implications in how we are doing business as a centralized exchange in three jurisdictions. Um, before Bitflyer, I was legal advisor for Silvergate Bank. Um, they're a, a leading banking partner to the cryptocurrency space, and I helped to grow their cryptocurrency practice and determine the due diligence that they should be doing on individuals and companies that want a crypto-related bank account with their bank. So excited to be here talking with everyone today. Hello, everyone. My name is Steve Jane. Uh, I've been following and contributing to the BISC network for uh, a little over a year now. Uh, I have a background in... Oh, awesome. <laughs> I wasn't going to ask who used BISC because that would kind of be against the whole idea, but anyway. Um, yeah, so I have a background in software development and finance. I don't do either for BISC. I do mainly a technical writing and documentation and that kind of thing. Um, BISC, for those of you guys who don't know, is... Uh, first and foremost, software. Uh, it's free software, free as in freedom. A software that you download to your computer. When you run it, you essentially become your own Bitcoin exchange. And as you might imagine, that's, uh, it becomes a bit of a gray area in terms of regulation. And I'm sure we'll talk more about what that means and uh, what, that, what, that, uh, yeah, what that actually means uh, more over the next few minutes. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. So why don't we do like a really quick high level 101 on U.S. regulations and each of the panelists um, involvement and kind of the global regulatory context? Sure. Yeah. So uh, money transmitters in the United States are subject to the Bank Secrecy Act. Uh, one of their obligations is to understand um, source of funds in uh, their customers' transactions. So, for example, if you're a centralized exchange service, you need to know whether your customer is depositing funds from a legitimate source or from um, criminal uh, entities of some kind, be it theft from another exchange or a ransomware wallet or a dark marketplace. And so um, exchanges can use our software to determine that. They can screen transactions and work out what the ultimate source of funds are. Okay. Um, in terms of Bitflyer, we launched in the U.S. trying to find a good balance of embracing regulation while still not, you know, losing sight of the goal of what Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is. Um, we chose to go down a typical money transmitter licensing route and did obtain the New York Bit license, which um, obviously has interesting implications uh, in terms of increased regulatory scrutiny and more reporting requirements. Um, so that's been interesting as we've expanded into the U.S. and also interacting with federal regulators, FinCEN, OFAC, the SEC, CFTC, um, being based out of Tokyo, Japan, where the FSA is sort of the uh, main regulatory agency. It's been interesting to explain why there are so many different regulatory uh, bodies that we may have to answer to or um, comply with their regulations. So that's sort of the lens that I'll be bringing today when we t as we're talking. Uh, yeah, Bisca software, you can download it and run it and install it wherever you want, wherever you are in the world. I mean, uh, we, I guess um, generally the approach that's taken in the project is you're using the software uh, on your own will or at your own discretion. And 
you should comply with the regulations in your jurisdiction uh, as best as you can. The software is a tool, like Bitcoin is a tool, like uh, you know other software tools, um, and uh, compliance is, is your responsibility. Yeah. So one view is that FATF's guidance represents the first major step towards global regulatory clarity. However, cryptocurrency exchanges and other virtual asset businesses are struggling with the meaning and the impact of this new guidance, which some adopt, which once adopted will require virtual asset service providers uh, to pass customer information to each other when transferring crypto assets, which historically has been done through the Bank Secrecy Act with um, uh, wires and wire transfers, and it's been called this the travel rule. So what is your take on the FATF guidance, um, what was just recently issued this past Friday, I believe, and in your opinion, what does it mean for the industry around protecting and sharing uh, confidential and personal data? And we'll start with you, Tom. Sure. So for those of you who don't know what FATF is, it's the Financial Action Task Force. It's an intergovernmental body which basically makes recommendations about um, what regulations countries should put in place in order to prevent money laundering and terrorist financing. And just last week, they released guidance on how, um, on how they thought countries should be regulating what they call virtual assets. Um, it was a bit of a mixed bag overall, fairly positive. Um, so the first thing it did was basically um, make, well, it, what it will do is make regulation uniform across the world. So the kinds of regulations that US crypto companies have been subject to now for several years, um, that will now hopefully be applied by countries all over the world. Um, we as a company spend a lot of time tracing proceeds of crime in Bitcoin. Um, and what we often see is that criminals cash out at exchanges in jurisdictions where there isn't much regulation. And so hopefully this FATF guidance will help to um, plug those gaps and give criminals fewer options about where they can cash out their, their proceeds. I think where FATF did overreach, though, is, is um, in the area called the travel rule. So what the travel rule says is that basically if um, Alice has uh, an account at, say, Kraken, and Bob has an account at Gemini, then if Alice sends one Bitcoin from her account at Kraken to Bob's account at Gemini, then it means that Kraken needs to share information on those two individuals. Um, so for example, uh, Kraken will need to send to Gemini Alice's name, Alice's postal address, and also Bob's name. And I think that the reason they've applied this is because they're used to financial systems which are intermediated, where we have the likes of banks who are intermediating all transactions. However, it doesn't really make sense um, in a world where you can make transactions peer to peer. So for example, how is Kraken going to know that it's sending Bitcoin to another exchange? They could try and use blockchain analysis, but that doesn't work if the, the uh, destination address has never been used before. Also, how are they going to share that data? There is no equivalent in the crypto world of Swift. So are we going to have to create a new centralized body to handle that, that information? Um, so lots of unknowns. Having said that, that's the position we're in now. Uh, the industry needs to work out how it's going to comply with these rules, and uh, we're working with our clients to help them do that. Um, so as a globally regulated exchange, the first thing I have to say is that it is now guidance that everyone, uh, that my three entities are needing to determine how to best comply with. Um, but I do think that the guidance itself was a bit ill-informed in terms of not understanding the intricacies and implications of crypto. It's, it's another example of sort of a new technology trying to be fit into an old law. Uh, the travel rule comes right. from the banking industry when it was very clear on how to send someone's information from one bank to another. Um, and there's you know, information security concerns in my mind in terms of like really figuring out how exchange A and exchange B share that information. Um, 
I also think that there's easy ways to get around it, like the use of a private wallet. <laughs> Uh, and so at the end of the day, I'm not sure the effectiveness of it. Um, and that's difficult when there's guidance like that that we're required to comply with. But right. at the end of the day, there may be other more effective ways to be overseeing the, the crypto space. So. The BISC network cannot share data because it does not collect data. Um, and that is... <laughs> <laughs> It, that's, and it's not a matter of policy. It's not that the people running the network don't want to do it or have some high uh, ideals that prevent them from, from doing so. The network is structurally not capable of collecting data. It is a peer-to-peer -peer network. When you run BISC, you are connecting to other nodes on the BISC network uh, through the BISC peer-to-peer -peer network, which is built on top of Tor, so you get all the anonymity, privacy, security benefits of that. Um, data that is, uh, that is on the network uh, is primarily two types. There is offers that you have outstanding to buy or sell Bitcoin, and you have uh, payment account data, so uh, bank account information, uh, whatever payment, uh, fiat payment methods you, you use to transact. Um, uh, Payment account information is stored locally on your hard drive. It's never sent anywhere until a trade, uh, you enter into a trade and confirm your intention to trade with someone else. At that point, your data is sent encrypted over the network to the uh, counterparty, at which point it's decrypted so that they can make, you make the payment to you. Um, and so it's literally, peer, everything is peer-to-peer. -peer. There is no... Uh, you know, server that's uh, 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 implementing uh, centralized, any kind of, no any notion of centralized accounts. There is no server that's providing an order book. Uh, the order book that you see in the software is uh, aggregated from other nodes on the network. Um, and so in order to collect data, there would have to be some kind of, uh, well, there is no way to do it. There would have to be some kind of a server to sit and somehow listen uh, to every message and um, somehow collect it and decrypt it and, and, and archive it. But that's just not part of the design. I, I think an interesting... Oh, you all can cheer. <laughs> I think an interesting thing to note is just that based on the, the way a company does business, regulation applies differently. And there is this um, spectrum in which the way someone chooses to present a product, either like Bitflyer through an open order book or BIS through a more decentralized method, it does change the regulatory hurdles. Um, but I think that there's value in having centralized exchanges that do collect KYC. Some people in this room may not be a fan of that approach and may not use those types of exchanges. But at the end of the day, those types of exchanges are doing the due diligence to try to ensure that some of the people on the platform uh, that are entering the space that could bring reputational harm to you know, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency that we're trying to pro pro progress and, and have you know, legitimized in a way, um, I, I think that there's value in sort of both um, ways of, of offering uh, the, the service of exchange. So, Sure. Yeah. And um, so... Paxful is part of Blockchain Alliance, and we're also part of Project Participate, which was just announced earlier this month at the Europol conference. So we view partnerships as uh, really important, and I'm curious, Haley, um, how you view kind of the partnerships and collaboration within the industry, um, you know, if it's something important and the valuable um, for us to kind of be learning from each other and helping the industry grow from the regulatory and compliance angle. Yeah, so um, Bitflyer in Japan has always been a really big proponent of uh, self-regulating organizations. And, and the goal with a self-regulating organization isn't more regulation. There is plenty of regulation. It's helping the regulation be more um, guided and more educated and more um, specific to the crypto industry. So, so because of that, when we launched in the US, uh, I, I launched with the foot of like, let's get all the exchanges in the room. Maybe we get centralized and decentralized exchanges in a room and, and talk through some of the things we're seeing and ways that like we're doing things to, to um, 
best practices. So um, Bitflyer is part of the Virtual Commodities Association with uh, Gemini, Bittrex, and Bitstamp currently. I know there's a lot of other working groups. I right. think um, I think that like just the FATF guidance alone is a good example of how to actually figure out how the logistics of sharing information. There's going to need to be more interaction with one another, and uh, I hope I hope we start to see a lot more of that. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think it's really important that crypto companies talk to each other a lot more. Um, I don't think there is a great deal of collaboration in, in the industry at the moment, and they should be sharing their insights. So, for example, if one exchange is seeing its users try to launder money through its platform or steal money from it in a new way, then they should you know, share that insight with um, their peers. Um, I think another area is, is uh, customer data sharing, though, and there's, um, I think, a growing trend to encourage institutions to share customer data. And I think there needs to be um, a lot of care taken around that. There needs to be proper legal mechanisms um, governing how that's shared, um, just to make sure that it's being shared for the right reasons. Absolutely. Um, Steve, as BISC is a decentralized exchange, uh, how do you view regulation and the need for KYC play out for decentralized exchanges? I think, um, I think there are a couple parts to that. I think uh, at first we have to um, really uh, flesh out what we mean by decentralized exchange. Um, it kind of seems like it's become kind of a buzzword. Uh, if you look at uh, some of the ventures out there that claim to be decentralized exchanges, um, yes, sure, you know, custody is with the users, but beyond that, what's really decentralized? Um, you know, I think the Binance Dex was um, uh, is a great example. I think a couple of few days ago they they geo blocked uh, a lot of countries, um, and I think there was some fine print about the, the actual custody part maybe not being as uh, as uh, as transparent as it as it appeared at first. Um, I don't know. So there's there's that aspect of it, and and and. On, I guess on the other side, the regulatory guidance that, that I've seen uh, for decentralized applications, uh, I guess DAPS, as, the, the, uh, as FinCEN calls it, is, is not very clear. Uh, I mean, I've seen the, the definitions of you know, what is a, a person, what is a, what is a DAP in the first place. Um, these things are not very clear. Um, and so you have, you, have, you have ambiguity on the side of uh, the guidance coming from the government, and then you have ambiguity over what is a decentralized exchange in the first place. What do you need to do to become uh, one in the first place? Um, and then you have like BISC, for example, which is I would say on the extreme end of the ex of the spectrum. Uh, I think the the big step that BISC makes that really makes it different from other decentralized exchanges uh, is. Uh, kind of what I mentioned in my introduction of the uh, person becoming the exchange. All the guidance I've seen seems to indicate that uh, there's an exchanger providing the service, and then there's a person who's consuming that service. Um, but with BISC, the two kind of come together. And so you have this thing with uh, this dynamic, kind of like what you have with Bitcoin, where uh, you would have, uh, it used to be that you would consume banking services from a bank as a customer. Um, but Bitcoin, if you run a full Bitcoin node, you're kind of doing these two things. You're becoming the bank. You have custody of your assets, and you can send them to whoever you want. And so, but we don't ask uh, full node uh, operators to apply for a banking license. So are we going to go to people who run BISC and ask them to file you know, a Form 107 or whatever to uh, become a money transmitter or money service business? That seems equally out of place to me. Um, so I, I think it depends on exactly what are we referring to when we talk about decentralized exchanges. And um, yeah, we need some more clarity as well in the, uh, from, from governments, I think, too. Yeah. So we heard through the conference kind of various opinions on Libra. And curious to know, what are your thoughts on Libra? And what is your understanding of it in terms of the global risks and Facebook's kind of having so much, like a holder of so much data also. Sure. Yes. With you, Tom. So I think there's two aspects to this. There is Calibra, the Libra wallet that's going to be operated by Facebook, and then there's the Libra, the 
Ledger, the currency that is going to be run by an association. So in terms of Calibra, um, there are going to be some very interesting insights that Facebook are going to be able to glean by combining social network information with financial network information, which could potentially be exploited in ways that we as a society don't want. So I think there's going to be a role there for some type of oversight or regulation to make sure that's been done appropriately. In terms of Libra Association, um, the currency is based on a reserve which backs the currency. Um, so there's going to be a need for some kind of regulation of that. For sure. Do they actually have the assets um, that are purportedly backing up um, this currency? And the main business model of being a validator in Libra is that you're going to make a return from the reserve. So there is going to be the temptation to have riskier and riskier a assets in that reserve. What kind of controls are there going to be on that such that the, the value of this currency is going to be maintained? So when I think of uh, Libra and the project that Facebook's presenting, I have to, in my mind, sort of separate my personal opinion on Facebook and how they've handled personal data and the use of it, um, and think of it more in the lens of what it can do, good or bad, for Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency industry. Um, I think that what will happen is um, they will be, they already are experiencing a lot of the regulatory hurdles that many companies in the space have experienced. And that may, you know, postpone, delay, or even like prevent them from actually getting this project going. Um, and so if that happens, we'll be able to really sort of have a test on the, um, or proof of the value of Bitcoin in the way it works, in the decentralized manner it works, because no matter how much of an association Libra creates or um, how decentralized they try to make it, at the end of the day, it's a digital currency that a large company of Facebook is putting out there. Um, but the other thing that will be interesting if they have all these regulatory challenges is it's a, it's a large-scale example for the world and regulators to take note of in, the, in terms of regulation stifling innovation. So for whatever your opinion is on Facebook, they're really trying to do something you know, re relatively innovative by offering a new way of payment through um, Calibra. And so it'll be a, an interesting example of how this sort of works on the regulatory front. I'm, I'm really interested in seeing how these hearings and things go. Uh, the only thing I, I will add also is that I will be interested to see the route that Calibra goes in terms of licensing, because I know that part of their goal is to use exchanges that already have licenses to get those uh, that currency in circulation. But at the end of the day, they may also need to obtain licenses, and it, may, it could be a good use case to try out the OCC trust charter um, rather than going the money transmitter and New York DFS route. So we'll see. So we're running short on time. I'll just, I don't have too much more to add. I'll just say that uh, you can add assets on BISC by making a pull request. You just fork the code, add the asset you want to you wanna add, and uh, submit it. Um, I'm not going to be the one make, to make that pull request for Libra. <laughs> <laughs> and just uh, very quickly, as we're running out of time, if we had like a magic eight ball, um, where do you see crypto regulation heading? Just really quickly. So I think the big emerging challenge for Bitcoin is going to be around the regulation of uh, lightning nodes. They could well be subject to regulation in the future, um, and it's an emerging area we should keep an eye on. Um, I think that there's going to be a lot more focus on the collaboration we've touched on today um, right. amongst global regulators, so much more inter interaction between global regulators trying to figure out things like the FATF guidance. Um, I also think that uh, collaboration in the United States will continue to increase and probably continue to have battles trying to kind of keep regulation from stifling what Bitcoin is. Yeah. I put BISC in the same basket as, as Bitcoin, BitTorrent, uh, Tor, these, pro these, these, these services that uh, BitTorrent, I think, is a great example. The whole show business industry put its might, billions of dollars, lobbyists, lawyers, and they couldn't take it down. Um, I'd be interested to see you know, how this plays out uh, with, with uh, similarly, what I think of as a similarly robust uh, software like BISC. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. I think that's all the time we have. Thanks.